Y'all sound great. If you are new or you're visiting, glad you're here. My name's Tyler. I am the downtown pastor. This is actually the third week, the third week of our series called We Are the Austin Stone. The whole point of this is for us as a people to kind of align together to say, what's the kind of church that we want to be? And what you're seeing is every single week, the mission of this church, the mission of the scriptures that God has given to his people is to love. It's really simple. What you see again and again in the Bible is that God has saved the people, called the people, and then sent a people to go and love, to love God, love the church, love the city, and to love the nations. And like I've been saying every single week, we get together. I, I just, I want you to hear this, not simply as vision of leadership of a church, I want you to hear it as just me teaching you and us teaching you what the scriptures say and God's vision for your life, God's story for your life. And that when we do that together, we'll be this church that all of us want to be a part of. And so we looked at loving God, loving the church. This week is loving the city. So I'm gonna start off this sermon with a question to you. It's a pretty broad question, but it's an important one. And it's honestly, in our day and age, a question that's being asked a lot, maybe not this explicitly, but it's being asked a lot. What kind of society do you want to live in? Like what kind of community do you want to belong to? To, to say it at a more local level for our purposes, what kind of city do you wanna be a part of? Like what kind of city do you wanna live in? And, and I don't mean what kind of amenities does the city have, I don't mean industry, I don't mean hobbies, I don't mean restaurants, well, what I mean is what do you want the values of the city you live in to be? Like what are those values that are non-negotiable for you? What are those practices, what are those norms, what are those cultural behaviors that you want to define the city that you live in? Right, what's your vision for this city? Now I doubt many of you have wake up, woke up this morning and think, and ask yourself the question, what kind of city do I wanna live in today? You didn't think that. You got on your electric scooter and you zoomed around, didn't think about that at all, right? But it's something that all of us are thinking about whether you say it or not because what's amazing right now is all over the world, all over the world, people are moving into cities at an exponential rate because there's something about cities right now that's attractive to us. And even if what's attractive to us are the opportunities a city affords us, there's still something about a city, and I think it's more than just opportunity, something about the culture, the community, the diversity of it, the inclusive nature of it, that all of us are sort of drawn to. And we don't really even know why, but there's this notion of the city that I want to belong to, the kind of society that I want to live in. Well, every group in the world has a vision for what society should look like, every group. Do not be fooled and think Christians are the only ones who have values they want to impose on society. That's everybody. But the church has a vision. God has given his people a vision in the word of God what he wants us to be and what he wants the city around us to look like. But here's what happens. Oftentimes, the church settles for a vision of our city that is so much smaller than God's kingdom. So often the church, the church, we settle for a vision of our city that's so much smaller than God's kingdom. What we settle for, we settle for personal preferences. We settle for personal agendas. We settle for cultural capital. We settle to feeling hip and cool. We settle for political intrigue and moves we could make. We settle for our kingdom over God's kingdom. And so what happens when the church does this, when we do this, it feels like the church's vision for what the city could be like is no more compelling than the other nonprofit next door. It just feels like the church is one of many nonprofits with a couple of good intentions, hoping that we may be able to serve the city in some form, some fashion, but when we articulate what we're after, it feels like, well, that's just what every other nonprofit is doing in a different way. Because I'm convinced that the vast majority of biblical Orthodox churches, like even ones who don't, who don't align with us on everything, just, just Orthodox Christianity, I have yet to meet a church that doesn't sincerely want to love their city and the world around them. It's not sure there are churches who don't wanna love the world around them, but they're on the fringes of society. They don't have much, they don't have hardly any influence or cultural clout. 
And even the, the churches that are more angry or fearful towards the city around them, they still have a vision too. They're just mad that their vision is not being actualized in the city in which they live. But for the most part, when I meet Christians and I meet churches in our city, I have not, I've yet to meet one who's like, ugh, I hate our city. I haven't had it happen yet. And maybe you lived in Waco, you may feel that way, but we live in Austin, okay? If you're from Waco, welcome. It's better here. You know, like it's just, everyone has a vision for the city, but churches For all of our intent, we want to love the city, but what happens is we tend to fail in loving the city around us in all the ways God has called us to. Here's what churches do. Churches tend, and we are guilty of this too sometimes. Churches tend to emphasize certain aspects of God's kingdom in the city around us. So, some churches will emphasize God's vision for his relationship with people who are far from him. Right, so they read the scriptures, they see God cares a lot about how you know him. So they see God's call in the scriptures for theological precision, see God's call for personal faith in Jesus, see God's call for us to actually follow him, for us to be disciplined in our morality and submit to him. And so churches that have that, they see that as the, they wouldn't diminish other things or they wouldn't deny other things the church has to do in the city, but they see that as the ultimate. So these churches, when they see problems in the city, what do they think the primary solution is? Evangelism and teaching, right? If the main thing is theological exactness and personal faith, then what the city needs most in order to love it is evangelism and teaching, some churches. Other churches, they emphasize God's vision in our relationship with ourself and those closest to us. They see God and his word again and again having these promises of peace and emotional warmth and passion. They see God showing up and causing delight to spring up in you. They see God as this personal experience that you actually have. They see God giving you a new identity and and more uh, psychological healing. They see God causing relational fullness and filling. So they wanna love the city, They, they, they care about theology, they care about other things, but they see Their sense is people really need help in those areas. And so what's their solution? Well, they tend to emphasize things like counseling, things like worship, right? Things like personal experience, things like empathy, all of which are good things. Because the primary problem that the the city has is they don't actually know the love of God for themselves and their relationships are falling apart because of it. So that's what they emphasize. While other churches emphasize God's vision for our relationship with the world. So what they see in the scriptures is how God again and again and again calls his people, calls Israel for social justice. He calls his people to care about systems that produce inequity among people, especially for those people who are marginalized. You who read the Bible again and again and again, God calls out his people for walking over people and trampling on the poor and the powerless. They see it clearly in the Bible. They think to love our city then What's the primary thing this church should do? Serve, speak up, and see that power and resource is shared with those who need it most. Once again, all good things. That's what churches do. And and it feels like all of those are important, but the one that they lean towards is the most important. I wanna ask you that. Which one do you lean towards? Do you think, okay, what the city really needs is evangelism and teaching? Or the city really needs counseling and empathy and understanding? Or the city really needs social justice and for us to speak on behalf of the poor, the orphan, and the widow? Which way do you lean? The way you can really figure this out is if you think to yourself, which one of those things do you get most mad at our church for not doing? Like which email have you started and it's in your draft folder right now with my name on, I can't wait to tell them we don't do this well, right? That's the one that you care about most. It's not bad, but we all tend to emphasize one or the other. But God's vision, God's vision for society, for the world, for our city is so much bigger than that. Hear me, it's so much bigger than any one of those categories. Listen, what God is doing, he is working and moving all things to where he restores all things in Jesus. That's what he's doing. Don't think so small about your little lie, that's all that God is doing. He is restoring 
all things through the work of his son. So it isn't just about individuals having right doctrine and personal faith. It isn't just about our emotions and new identities and relationships. It's not just about cultures being fair and just. God's vision is all of those things and so much more. Jesus did not come to the earth just to make you a little bit more spiritual. He didn't come here to make you just a little bit nicer. He didn't come here to make you someone who doesn't cheat on tests. He came to do all those things, but it's so much bigger than that, so much more grand than that. He came so he could purchase your inclusion into God's love, refining and restoring the entire universe. Entire universe. If you're thinking about your faith and your little life as his primary end game, you're thinking too small. You're part of a story that's gonna last forever and is far bigger than you or me, but we get to be caught up into the harmony and the beauty and the restoration of all things in Jesus. See, the story of the Bible, I'm not sure if you've read Genesis 1 before, but the story of the Bible, humanity begins with God in a garden, but it ends with everyone who belongs to Jesus in a city with God. It begins in a garden and it ends in a city. I wanna read to you the vision that John had, the apostle, of what's gonna happen one day in Revelation 21. So I want you to see, this is the city we're aiming towards. Revelation 21, verse one. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. That means there's no more chaos. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. This is his vision for our city. This is the vision of God's city with his people forever. God's vision is not that earth finally goes up into heaven. His vision is heaven finally comes down. That the heavenly culture of that holy city called the New Jerusalem comes down and redeems and restores all that is corrupt about our earthly cities. And what is spiritual and what is heavenly is perfectly wed with what is physical and material. On that day, the reason all that's gonna happen because God himself will dwell with us fully, fully, in love and in truth. So on that day, guess what? Our theological categories will no longer have any error in them. Our personal faith will no longer have any sin in them. On that day, all of the emotional torment and turmoil we go through, all the psychological pain we have, all the relational trauma we have, what does he say? It's gonna wipe away every tear from your eye. Think how close you have to get, some, get to, to somebody to wipe away tears from their eyes. That's how close God will be to you. On that day, there will no longer be corrupt social forces. No more oppression, no more racism, no more pain, no more disease. Because the perfect king will come and he will reign over all things and he's just and he's good and he's kind and he's right. And on that day, this won't be a vision you and I talk about. It'll be a reality. You'll get to see it. And on that day, everyone who's there in that city is not there because they were godlier than anyone else. Everyone who's there on that day from every tribe, tongue, and nation all over the planet, everyone who's there on that day, they're only there because all of us agree, I'm only in this incredible story of love because Jesus died for me. That's it. 
I'm not any better than the people who aren't in this city. I just have trusted and believed Jesus is all that I have and the only reason I'm a part of it. That's the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of God in its absolute fullness. That's what we're aiming towards. That's the city that every other city that the church aims to be, or the church aims to flourish, or church aims to create. That's our template, that's our blueprint. We're trying to show the kingdom, we're trying to show the city what the kingdom of God looks like. But listen, you can't bring that kingdom yet. Right, how does this happen? It says, God came down. The new Jerusalem comes down. So you don't have any control over that. So what does it mean for us to do it now? What does it mean for us to bring the kingdom in part now? What does it mean for you and for me in daily, realistic, practical sort of ways, how do we bring the kingdom of God now? Because this is why, listen, if you're a Christian, this is your primary purpose here. Your primary purpose is not to make money. Your primary purpose is not to have sex. Your primary purpose is not simply to have the world revolve around you. No, you will be most happy when you are living in light of his love and helping others know that love. I say this all the time, but your best days are the days you don't think about you. Your best days is when you can get lost in love of another, God and others. Those are your best days. Your worst days are when you always spend your days self-analyzing and self-pitying self-critiquing, self-loathing. Those are your worst days. And the gospel of Jesus comes to you and says, no, no, you're taken care of, God loves you. But I failed, I know, and he still loves you. So go help other people see what that love is like. That's why you have a job, that's why you have intellect, that's why you have a career. It's for you to be a part of building a kingdom much bigger than your own. A kingdom that won't die out, a kingdom that will last forever. So I thought, what's, man, what is the best way to think about how to bring the kingdom of God? So I thought, hmm, who brought the kingdom of God the best? Jesus, turns out, Sunday school answer is correct. So I thought, I'm gonna go to the Gospels. And there's three verses in the Gospels that I think summarize the way Jesus brought the kingdom of God to cities in his day. And Jesus did three things. These three things, and we'll be done. Jesus, he declared the good news of the kingdom. He demonstrated the effects of his kingdom. And he did all of that in close proximity and in compassion to those outside of his kingdom. Look at Matthew 9, 35 through 36. It says, and Jesus went throughout all cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus' kingdom, when he comes in, he says he declares, he demonstrates, and he does so in close proximity. And what I love is the spiritual and the physical are both important to him. It's not one or the other. He comes declaring and demonstrating, speaking and serving to show off what the kingdom of God is like. So notice what he says first. He says, it was teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus was not content simply performing miracles, healing people, caring for their needs while they had no understanding of what was going on. While they had no personal commitment to him or to what he was doing, his kingdom, listen, his kingdom has content. His kingdom has content. It's not just a feeling that you have. His kingdom has edicts with it from the king. The gospel is the good news that God has come to save you in Jesus. That's the good news he came to proclaim, and this is news you have to hear. This is a message you have to understand, you have to process through and believe. Jesus wanted these cities in particular to know clearly who is God and who is he not. One of the things Jesus would do often in his ministry He would say things like, you have heard that it was said, but truly I say to you. He says this in Matthew 5, verse 27. I'm not gonna read the whole verse, but just the first part so you can see this teaching mechanism he used. He says, verse 27, you have heard that it was said, dot, dot, dot. He tells them, here's what you heard. Here's what you've been taught. 
Verse 28, but I say to you. He'd be in a crowd like this. He says, hey, you guys have heard this. And everyone's like, yeah, that's pretty good. I like that. Wrong. That's what it is. That's a wrong answer you believe. That's what he would say. You've been taught this, but here's what's true. You've been taught God is like this. He's not. You've been taught this is where life is. It's not. You've been taught this is what's beautiful. It's not. Here's where life is. Here's what's beauty. Here's what's love. Here's what God is like. So listen, if you are going to love our city and show them the kingdom of God, you're gonna have to open your mouth. You're gonna have to speak. You're gonna have to tell them all that God has promised in Jesus. No one wanders into the kingdom of God. No one's just walking around and like, what? I'm a Christian, oh my gosh. Like, no, that doesn't happen. It's not how that happens. Now, what happens typically is you begin to believe sort of and then you realize, oh, I believe more than I, real, than I understood. But no one wanders into the kingdom. No one accidentally falls into faith in Jesus. But listen, rarely have I met anybody who believed in Jesus the first time they heard it. I, I just don't know anyone who's like the very first time, this is who Jesus is. Yeah, I'm all in on that. I just haven't met them before. Most of the time, you hear it, you're perplexed. For most of you in this room, I'm sure when you finally believed the gospel, it was probably the millionth time you heard it. And then you go back and you think, oh, my old church, they didn't preach the gospel. Yes, they did, you weren't listening. That's how that works, right? They probably did, you just were in the back doing nothing, right? If you're in the back, no, no judgment here. I'm glad you're here. Um, maybe you're here, I don't know. Um, but that's the thing is you need to hear it multiple times. And to truly love the city the way Jesus loved the city, notice what he says. You have heard that it was said. That means he knew what they were thinking. He had heard what they were saying. He knew their teachers well enough to be able to prop up what they believed and them go, yeah, that's what we believe. If you're going to love this city, you need to ask questions about the people in this city. You need to get to know them. You need to know their story. You need to know their experiences with the church. You need to hear about how their perceptions about God have ebbed and flowed over the course of their life. See, what happens often is Christians, I think, like talking about Jesus to people in our city, not even so they could believe or love them, but just so we could tell our small group we evangelized this week. Like, whew, no one asked about that now, I did it, right? And they're like, well, I have more questions. No, no, that was your only opportunity. There you go, that's what you get. I think sometimes we don't ask questions because I don't know if we really care. If you're gonna talk to somebody in our city about who Jesus is, you're gonna have to ask them what they think. Ask them why they think that. Ask them the stories that shape their life. And then you love them enough to speak back and to say, well, I know you've heard that it was said that the only way you could ever be happy is to work your life to where your circumstances are perfect. But actually the joy that you can have in Christ is bigger than your circumstances. It's so big that even suffering can't take it away. Oh, I know you've heard that it was said that forgiveness from God is not really a thing that you need or forgiveness with God may be impossible because of what you've done or who you've been. But I'm telling you that in Jesus, he died because we do need forgiveness, but he died so you'd know you could have it in him. You've heard it was said, but truly I tell you. To bring the kingdom of God is gonna have to speak, but also to bring the kingdom of God is to serve, because God is also making all things new. Look at verse 35 again. It says, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. So he teaches about spiritual realities, and he cares about physical ailments. He's not only concerned that people have right knowledge about God. It's not as if, it's not as if all the kingdom of God does is make you attend church, listen to sermons, sing songs, and read your Bible, and that's it. But that's what so many of us think. We think all it is to be a Christian is to believe something one time, attend church every now and then, and that's basically it. Maybe get a family. 
Maybe live in a good neighborhood. And that's it. But the kingdom of God is so much more than that. He is not content with the city thinking that he is unconcerned or uncaring about the immense amount of pain and evil that exists in the city, that exists in the world. God didn't only make your soul, he also made your mind and your body and your emotions and the planet in which you live. He doesn't just want individuals to know him, he wants to change our societies. He wants to change laws. He wants to change the way we interact with one another. His kingdom is not merely intellectual and emotional. It's physical, it's gritty, it's earthy, it's tactile. So if you only speak the gospel, but you don't demonstrate care and concern for the physical needs of the world, then you are not giving them a picture of the kingdom of God. It's not in the way that Jesus brought it. You've heard of the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan, and Jesus is teaching that those who possess the eternal life of God will be those who love their neighbor in their city. So here's the parable. There's a Jewish man who gets beaten very badly so severely he's close to death and he's robbed. He's lying on the side of the road. And Jesus says, well these two really spiritual, theologically educated Jewish men, a priest and a Levite, they, they go by this man individually, separately from one another, and the priest goes by, he sees the man there, he goes on the other side. The Levite comes by, he sees the guy there, he goes by on the other side. I'm sure all the while justifying themselves, all sorts of theological reasons and concepts, they have to go to the temple, they have things to do. He says that a Samaritan man came, and the Samaritan man was of an ethnic group who the Jews hated, who the Jews hated. And this man sees the Jewish man lying in the ditch, and he goes and he takes care of him, and he binds up his wounds, and he sees that he's taken care of. He doesn't preach anything to him. He doesn't teach him anything. All he does is he serves and loves across racial lines, across social boundaries, and that's what it means to love your neighbor. And so here's what Jesus does. He tells that parable, and for them, that would be shocking to hear the religious, spiritual people actually weren't the ones who possessed eternal life. It was the Samaritan, the ethnic group they hated, who possessed eternal life. This is what Jesus says. He says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the man who asked him the question, the Jewish man who asked him the question, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Loving our city means we must, must care about the physical needs and the social needs of our city. It's gonna require you to think deeply about the needs of other people and think about how, how is what God's given me? How can I use that to share and to serve those people who have fallen in difficult situations? To truly, listen, we are a, even if you're in college, you're thinking, I don't have any money. Relative to the world, we are a very affluent group of people. And you have to know that those who have less than you are not worse than you. They're not there because they were lazy and you're here because you worked hard. That is not true. They could have worked harder than you. You know, it's hard to think about. They could have worked harder than you and gotten less. There's all sorts of reasons for that. And we have to be people who go, wait, when I see the failures of other people, when I see someone in a different situation than me, I don't begin to say immediately, here's how we're different, here's how I'm strong, here's how I'm better than them. You may not say that out loud, you know better than say that out loud, but to feel it and to think it. When you see someone in a dire situation, the Christian response is to see yourself in them. To see yourself in them. To see people who, have, who are in tough times and think, even if they did sin into that, I've sinned in the same ways. I've sinned in the exact same ways, but why didn't mine lead to that? I don't know. Why was I afforded certain social structures and systems and relationships and opportunities that they just didn't get? I don't know. But the response is to see that and show mercy, not to be calloused. 
And while everyone's needs in the city and everyone's pain in the city are all important to God, and we have to care about the whole city, not just part of it, not just where we live, but the entire city, and we live in one of, and if not the most economically segregated cities in the country, so it's really easy to live in areas where, no one, where everyone around you is in the same social class as you. So it makes it hard to think about other parts of the city and what they feel like. It's hard for West Austin to relate to East Austin, downtown to North and South. It's just difficult for us to see others' perspectives because of that. And yet what God tells the church is when you look at the city and you see all the need, you especially, you especially care about the needs of those who have no power and have little possessions. In particular, you care about those who can't care for themselves. In particular, the church has to care for the orphan and the widow, the immigrant and the unborn and the aging and the dying and the ostracized. God has no delight in a church that is theologically sound emotionally healthy, relationally fulfilled, and yet neglects the poor and the powerless. I need you to hear me. That sentence, I wrote it and I was like, man, I wanna believe that. We can be theologically sound, emotionally healthy, relationally fulfilled, and our church be a stench to God if we don't care for the poor and the powerless. Don't believe me? Listen to Amos. This is a famous text that Dr. Martin Luther King popularized in his preaching because it's true. It says this, verse 21. Listen how God talks to his people. I hate, I despise your feast, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs and to the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. This group of people, let's just call them a church for our purposes. They wanted to know God. They're offering to him what he says to offer, burnt offerings. They're singing songs. God commanded them to sing songs. They're supposed to. He says, I see your burnt offerings. I see your songs. I see your phenomenal worship service. But I don't care about them. I actually hate them because, because you trample down the poor. Because justice and righteousness are not things you value. Oh, you'll read your Bibles, but you don't care about your city. This is what he says earlier, Amos 5, 10 through 11. This is what he was accusing them of. He says, talking about them, they hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks truth. Verse 11, therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, they took advantage of the powerless. Even if they weren't doing it themselves, they saw it and did nothing. Verse 12, for I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Taking a bribe means you're letting those with power and wealth not be held accountable. You're, not, you're being partial to those who have, why? Why is the church partial to those who have power? Because we want some too. Why would you take a bribe? Because I'd rather have a benefit from the world than a blessing from God. And the church is so often guilty of this, is we don't serve those who are needy or serve those on the fringes or serve those who have nothing to give us. Why? Because we only want to serve those who will give us something back. But someone who's been oppressed and marginalized, they can't give you anything. And that's what God is saying. Let justice, let righteousness be what you're known for. This is why God hated their worship services and why he would, that's why he would hate ours. 
that we'd be faithful to so many things and neglect those who don't have. More than happy to evangelize, but very hesitant to sacrifice. God's vision for the church isn't merely for individual Christians to get a little better. It's for the people of God to bear the weight of the problems and the needs of our city. For us to be a church, and honestly, we're big enough as a church across all of our campuses, for us to be a church that if we just disappeared overnight, the city would go, wow, we feel that. So many churches disappear and nobody notices. Maybe that could happen for all sorts of reasons, but maybe it's because that church wasn't really blessing the city like the way they thought they were. That's the kind of vision God has for us because God's making all things new, including our society. So Jesus declared the good news in his speaking. He demonstrated the good news in his healing. And last thing, really quickly, he did all of this out of compassion. He did all of this out of compassion in close proximity. Verse 35 and 36, last time. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. Verse 36, here's what's going on inside of him. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He loved the cities because when he saw the crowds, he had compassion. He didn't look at the crowds of people who didn't know God far from God and have frustration with them because look at the way they're behaving. Look at the way they're voting. They're doing the way they're supposed to. He didn't look on the city with apathy and think, well, they seem okay. I guess they're fine. He wasn't callous and thought, well, they aren't affecting my life yet, so until they affect my life, I'm not gonna say or do anything. Instead, he looked at them and he felt compassion. Why? Because he knew nobody is truly looking out for their best. He sees them, they, they had leaders, but those leaders only wanted to use them. They didn't wanna love them. Listen, everybody in our city has tons of people trying to sell them on things. Tons of people trying to make money off the people in this city, but how many people are looking at Austin and thinking, my heart breaks because I know what's best for you? Not because I'm better than you, because I've tasted and seen something better. He had compassion for them. And I love that he came up close to teach them. He went into their cities to teach them. He went up close, he felt wounds. He placed his hand on wounds and healed them. He was able to look into their eyes of individuals and see the pain and hopelessness. Why you love the city is important. It's important. And your relationship to the city is important. Like if you love the city only because you have to, you're like, oh, well there's a sermon, I gotta go do something, right? If you only love the city because it's lovely to you, you'll never really serve. Because as soon as times get tough, you're gonna quit. As soon as you do one thing, the city seems okay, then you see another thing, you're thinking, oh, I have to do all of this? Then you won't serve. You won't endure in serving the city, because guess what, people change slow. Do you know you very well? How slowly do you change? This is the last time, God, for the millionth time, right? How slowly do you change? Well, how much more so for people you barely know? Culture changes way more slowly than we'd like it to. So you have to be in it because I have compassion and love for them. We have to love the city because we know, know in Jesus they have a shepherd and leader. They're not gonna find it anywhere else. We don't love the city so we can lead it. We love the city so Jesus would. He's the one that died for them so they could live. We have compassion for them, but also you have to be close enough to hear them. You can't do this from a distance. You can't retreat away from your neighbors and think, I'll love them from Twitter or Facebook. You can send all the heart emojis you want, that ain't gonna work, right? All the prayer hands you want, but you have to be actually in the thick of it and to hear their stories. I love that Jesus is interacting with actual people. People's stories matter. Their pain matters if they've been discriminated against by the church because of their race or sexual orientation or gender, that 
matters. And you'll never know those stories unless you're interacting with people. Don't settle for an article from The Atlantic, as great as that 4,000 word essay is. You didn't even finish it anyway. You skimmed over it, right? Get to know a person. Hear why they struggle to believe. Hear the wounds driving all their doubts in God. And when you hear people's stories, you know what you're gonna think? I've, I've thought this a thousand times. I hear their story and I think, man, if I went through that, I'd feel really similar to you. I haven't been through that, but if I had, I'd feel really similar to you. It's really hard to explain away people when you know their story. And you hear the ways they've been treated. You can't love from a distance. It has to be up close. So this is gonna mean so many different things for you as an individual, for us as a church. But here's what we wanna do. I wanna close tonight by showing you a story. It's a film our story team made. It's unbelievable about a woman in our church named Becca. And it's about her story of loving our city through foster care and adoption. And I wanna show you this story. It's like eight minutes long, so just settle in, turn your phone off, okay? But I'm telling you, it is so inspiring to see this is how you love our city. Let's go and watch this together.
I'm not crying, you're crying. Um, <laughs> the question I have for us, who in this city needs you to love them like that? Not hypothetical, not far away. Who at work, your school, your family, this city, who needs you to love them like that? Who needs your voice? Who needs your sacrifice? Who is it that God keeps bringing up and you keep not wanting to do it? Because that shows you the cost of love but the joys of it. I know Becca, I know Dexter, I know Jeremiah. That is, it is an up and down roller coaster sort of thing. But the joys on the back end of that picture to be able to say, those are her boys. She died to them years ago. And you will get to have the same sort of thing in the kingdom of God when Jesus comes back, you'll get to see there wasn't a moment in vain. There wasn't a sacrifice that wasn't worth it. Even if it didn't pan out, even if it didn't go the way that you thought it would go, when you follow Jesus to hard places, he always finds and always shows you he's sweeter than you thought. So who is it? Who is it that needs to see the kingdom of God and see the resemble, the glimpse of what the kingdom will be like one day? That for his kingdom come and his will be done here in Austin as it is in heaven. Let's pray together. Father, what a story and mission to be called up into. And I know all the fears in this room. I know all the doubts in this room, because I have every one of them. But God, would you begin through this process, through this church, begin to make clear where no individual in here is gonna solve all of this city's problems. But every individual here can serve to help in some way to bless in some way, to share in some way, to care in some way, to listen and speak in some way. Don't let us settle for small lives built around our own kingdoms. God, set us free to live for yours, to display to the world the way you have loved us. We're not doing anything novel, God. When we love this city, all we're doing is loving them the way you have loved us. You sought us out, you sacrificed, you loved before we ever loved you back, you gave before we ever gave anything back. You listened when everyone turned away. So God, as we dream, give us faith to believe what you call us to. As we sing, God, help us sing in faith about your love and what you've called us to. Pray all these things in Christ's name, amen. Amen, church, let's stand, let's sing together.